And today we are hosting today's seminar together with the Southern uh, African Society for Systematic Biology. Before I am handing it over to Panos to uh, introduce SAFSP to us, I would like to thank to all of you for uh, all of our speakers for their willingness uh, to join and give their presentation and for all of you for joining. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat box during the talks. And Panos, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Neriman. Um, on behalf of the South Af Southern Africa Society for Systematic Biology, I also would like to welcome you to our first first day seminar. And it's just um, very fortunate that we could combine the two today um, and, and sort of expose, get the fields together. So Fabi is, is, is very pleased that we can also join up with the society. Um, the society's focus is on systematics and covers may, uh, may, all the sort of biological fields. So you have microbiologists, you have um, mammal taxonomists, etc. So it's, it's quite a wide range, but we share a passion for systematics. And therefore, we're also very excited that you join us today in this theme. The, the outlay of it will be a little bit different from the normal FABI international seminars in the sense that typically for the FABI seminars, we only have the international speaker and then a question and answer session. But because of we as the SASSB, we are a um, society that would like to promote also our young researchers, we have opted for a webinar where we have an international speaker and then two local speakers, typically students. And today we will have two students um, joining us, um, Bilma Nell and Aidan Fasahi will give a short presentation afterwards. So um, it will be a slightly longer than usual, but I hope that you can stay until the end and enjoy it with us. And with that, I hand over to Brenda to introduce David to us. Thank you very much, Farnas. Good afternoon, or this good evening to everybody. I'm not quite too sure. Well, we certainly know that we've got at least one um, person in the audience who's logged in from South America. So South Americans are, are pretty much in the same time zone as, as our speaker, David Hibbert. So good morning to those of you who, who are in morning time. And David, I hope you've got a nice um, cup of coffee to wake you up properly there. So it gives me a huge amount of pleasure to introduce David Hibbert to you. David is a very, very good friend, personal friend and a friend of Fabi. David agreed many years ago, we were actually working out, it was eight years ago, to come out and do a, a PhD oral defense for Tuan Dong, who is actually in this audience today. So, so David, we have very, very fond memories of you being out, out here with us, and, and we look forward to, to your next visit. So David is a professor in the Department of Biology at Clark University in Massachusetts. And David has an actual fact been at Clark University for, are we allowed to say a very long time, David? That <laughs> before um, coming to Clark, he completed his PhD with another very well-known mycologist and a friend of ours, um, Rita Spilgenitz. And David has been the recipient of, of many awards. And I think in, in the context of today, I want to focus on awards from the Mycological Society of America. This is a society that certainly I have attended many meetings of. It's, I think, probably the nicest mycological society in the world, but I don't know. This has been recorded. Maybe that's not a good thing to say. So David, many years ago, got the Alexopoulos Award. And David is, of course, now a fellow of the LSA and past president. So. David, we did invite members of the MSA to attend today, and I'm not quite too sure if we have um, some MSA members who join, and certainly we, we welcome them. And David is also on the highly cited researcher list, and when you kind of look at this list, and certainly as, as mycologists, somehow we don't get the citations that some of the medical people or some of the biochemists do. So I think that that speaks hugely to the 
the international profile that David's research is is getting. And I, David, I actually asked David to send me his his, his CV to be able to introduce him. And I, I'm not going to focus too much on it. Yeah, you know, he's he, he he's done all the things that he's meant to have done, raised lots of money. Um, probably spent a hell of a lot of time writing grants to be able to do that, and um, has a very impressive list of publications. And I invite you to go onto David's website. I actually did go onto the website there. Well, there's, there's I rather like that blog that you've got going there. That looks like fun. Um, and have a look at um, what David's been up to. But I'll I'll stop there, David. Thank you so much for being prepared to join us, and we look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank, thank you, Brenda, very much for that introduction. Thank you, everybody who was involved in inviting me to come here. It's a, uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor, really, to be with you today. This is my first interaction with the SASB, and I'm really pleased for that uh, to meet a new society. And of course, I am. Um, I'm very happy to be told I'm that a friend of Fabi. I feel very friendly towards Fabi. My visit there years ago remains one of my most cherished, um, you know, work-related visits because it was not all work and it was really quite wonderful and I'm forever grateful for the hospitality that I received. Um, so with that, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll start here today. Um, and I'm gonna to talk to you about um, one of my favorite organisms. Um, this is the genus Lentinula, uh, which you know I haven't, um, I haven't been giving talks on this very much in recent years. Mostly it's been phylogenomics, related to wood decay and, and classification and things like that. But um, in recent years, I've come back to working on Lentinula, which is the shiitake genus. And I'm gonna tell you about some very old work, um, some not so old work and some stuff that is still um, frankly quite raw and, and in progress. Um, so I'm gonna divide the talk into, uh, let's see. Uh, whoops, there we go, into really four sections. Uh, first, I have to tell you about some, just give you some general background on Lentinula, tell you about the taxonomy of the group. Um, I'm gonna present some research that is in review right now on phylogenetic diversity in the group based on ITS and TEF1. Um, mostly what I'll talk about, I think, is phylogenomics and population genomics, and then I'll conclude with some outstanding mysteries, because even though this is a well-known group of fungi, I hope to convince you that there's still uh, an awful lot to learn, a lot of discoveries probably to be made. Um, okay, so you all know this fungus. This is Lentinula idodes. This is the shiitake mushroom in Japanese. That means oak mushroom. It's pyogo in Korean, and it's shanggu uh, in Chinese. And this is um, one of the most widely cultivated mushrooms in the world. There was a 2017 study, I've got a figure here, which suggested it's, that it was the number one mushroom in the world, but it's always flirting between Lentinula, agaricus, and pleurotus. But Lentinula is certainly one of the big ones. So everybody knows shiitake mushrooms, very important commercially and of interest for potential medicinal properties um, and so on. Um, it was described in 1877 by Berkeley, the British mycologist, MJ Berkeley, as agaricus edotes, because back then everything with gills was in agaricus. Um, Berkeley described it based on material that he'd received uh, from the Challenger expedition, some material that was purchased in a shop in Japan. So it would have been um, uh, uh, a commercial, commercial sample of shiitake that he described the species based on. Um, there was some taxonomic controversy involving this extremely well-known organism. Um, the great mycologist Rolf Singer, who was you know, tremendously influential mycologist of the 20th century, uh, put the species in the genus Lentinus. Um, an another uh, somewhat less famous, but also very influential mycologist, David Pegler, who actually did a monograph on both Lentinus and Lentinula, said, no, 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 it's not a Lentinus. Uh, it's in the genus Lentinula, uh, which he placed in what he was calling the tribe Calibii in the agaric paley, so white spored agarics. So this was a big controversy for um, much of, I'd say, the late, tw late 20th century. You know, is shiitake a Lentinus or is it uh, a Lentinula? And I did my PhD a very long time ago on the genus Lentinus, and this is actually a figure from my PhD thesis 
uh, using a, what is now an embarrassingly small amount of data. Um, nonetheless, I think this holds up pretty well. Uh, uh, we have a diverse set of mushrooms in this tree. Uh, the groups labeled one, two, three are Lantinus in the broad sense. Here's Shiitake lentinula idotes, closely related to a Calibia. Remember, Pegler put it in the, in the Calibii with pretty strong support. So we figured that nailed it. Um, you know, we've done our due diligence now. I've finished with Shiitake. I can move on and just focus on Lentinus for the rest of my PhD. And that's what I did. And so I was prepared to leave Lentinula behind. But um, as it happens, I did a postdoc, my first postdoc at the Tottori Mycological Institute, which is in Japan. They are funded in large part by the shiitake industry. They excel at shiitake cultivation and strain development and so on. They're intensely interested in, in shiitake. So I found myself drawn back into the world of lentinula. And this is me a very long time ago looking much younger and rather happy. You'll notice the beers on the table here. This was a, a party with my colleagues. Um, so with my friends from TMI, uh, I launched a little molecular systematics project on lentinula using ITS. And our, our goal was really to test Pegler's classification system. So this is, um, so we'll run through that, focusing first on the Asian, Australasian things that Pegler recognized and then talk about the American things. So Pegler's, uh, Pegler's classification was very strongly influenced not just by morphology, but also by geography. And he divided Lentinula into, um, into five species, uh, three in Asia and Australasia, and then two in the Americas. So the things in Asia, Australasia included Idodes, Shiitake, which you've now seen pictures of and which you knew already something called Lateridia from Southeast Asia, so a tropical species, and then Novi Zelandi from New Zealand. And I'll show you a couple pictures of these species that you're probably not familiar with. Um, here are the sketches from Pegler's monograph, so Idodes, Novi Zelandi, and Lateridia. Here's a photograph of Lantinula Lateridia from Australia. It's got this kind of smooth, thin-fleshed pileus. And it's uh, very tasty, by the way. I've collected this in New Guinea, and it's, it's delicious. Um, and then here's the New Zealand species, Lentinula novi zelandi, which looks really different. It's got this kind of fuzzy, hairy stipe and uh, uh, you know, really heavy uh, squamules on the cap and so on. And it's got this kind of dark aspect. So those, um, those were Pegler's concepts of the um, species in Asia, Australasia. We used ITS, very simple analysis. And those data suggested that there are actually five lineages in Asia and Australasia shown here in this um, rather old tree from some publication of mine. So we, um, we called these, we gave these group names based on ITS clusters. And for the most part, we didn't do any taxonomy based on these, on this work. We didn't, we didn't translate this tree into formal taxonomy. So we had group one, which is Edodes. Uh, group two, which is Lateridia from Australia and New Guinea. Group three from New Zealand. Uh, group four, which is another group from New Guinea, and I'll have more to say about this one in a minute. And then group five from China and Nepal. And I'll talk, I'll be talking about, I'll be referring to these ITS-based groups throughout the talk. Um, so hopefully you'll get comfortable with um, that terminology. So here's a map just showing you where they all are. So group one in blue, so throughout continental Asia, Northeast Asia, also we had one isolate from Borneo, but also notice group five, our two isolates of group five in China and in Nepal. Um, group two in New Guinea and in Australia and Tasmania. Group four uh, also in New Guinea, very interesting. And then group three in New Zealand. Okay, so five ITS based groups of Lantanula. Uh, corresponding to three morpho species in the sense of David Pegler. Um, now my colleagues in, at TMI um, were very reluctant to translate the, those results into species descriptions in part because um, almost all of the isolates throughout Asia, Australasia are still made incompatible. So based on that criterion, you could think of them as being all one species, even though using molecular data, we can see many independently evolving lineages. Um, but it turns out not to be entirely clean on the mating front. So this is a figure from a paper by Shimomura and colleagues. Um, 
Uh, I've taken their table and just sort of annotated it. So um, the colored boxes refer to different groups of lentinula. So this is group four from New Guinea. This is uh, group two from New Guinea. And these are groups one, three, and five from throughout uh, Asia. And wherever you see a plus sign, that means that these things are mating compatible based on the criterion of being able to form clamp connections um, in, um, in culture. But what you can see here is that group four and group two are completely mating incompatible. So these sympatric populations in New Guinea are reproductively isolated. And the plus signs in parentheses on this yellow background in indicate partial mating compatibility. So group four is partially or fully reproductively isolated from other things in Asia, Australasia. And on that basis, uh, my colleagues at TMI said that these shiitake populations uh, in Australasia uh, are in the process of speciation, but weren't quite ready to pull the trigger and actually describe new species. Okay, so that's um, Asia, Australasia. We're gonna turn now to Pegler's concept of lentinula in the Americas. Um, and again, uh, there was a pretty strong geographic component and morphological component as well. So there were two species that he recognized, uh, lentinula boreana in trop trop tropical America, he said, which covers a lot of territory. And then Lentinula huarapiensis, a very mysterious species known only from the type collection uh, from Paraguay. So rather, rather obscure species there. And here are the pictures from the monograph. So here's Lentinula boreana, and here's Lentinula huarapiensis um, described by Spegazzini. Now, the uh, taxa in the Americas have been carved up into multiple species uh, by Juan Mata and Ron Peterson and colleagues based on mating compatibility and also um, ITS phylogenies. Um, so based on, based on those criteria, Mata and Peterson distinguished two new species, Lentinula rafanica and Lentinula aciculospora from Lentinula boreana. And here are some pictures of those. So here's rafanica from Brazil, um, here's a picture of Lentinula boreana taken in Mexico, and this is Lentinula aciculospora uh, from Costa Rica. And these are all edible and have a characteristic kind of oniony or garlicky aroma, which is a trait shared by um, all Lentinula species. So this figure here kind of represents the paradigm uh, based on ITS uh, for much of the last 20 years, which suggests that there are eight independent lineages in Lentinula that might warrant recognition as species, but not all of them have been formally described uh, yet. And showing you the map with the distribution in the Americas, excuse me, in the Americas and in Asia and Australasia. So it's, it's a fungus that is associated with the cuisines of Northeast Asia, but it really is um, very broadly distributed. Okay, next I wanna um, bring you forward a little bit to a project that's currently in review. It's been submitted. We wanted to update our understanding of the phylogenetic diversity of lentinula based on ITS, but also now bringing in a second marker, which is TEF1 alpha. Um, and this has been a really big collaborative project uh, headed largely by Nelson Manoli here, who's from Sao Paulo. Uh, this is Noemia Ishikawa, who's in Manaus. So a very strong Brazilian connection here. Um, these are some folks from my lab, other collaborators whose pictures I'll show you later. Uh, Chao Chun is from Guangdong in China. Marisol was a postdoc in my lab who's now in Sweden. So it's been a really international research project and that's been one of the things that I've found really fun about it. And, uh, and these are lentinula, of course. So what we did was we wanted to get a really broad sample of sequences uh, from all over the world and we got 343 ITS sequences together and 116 TF1 alphas, um, a bunch of new sequences, many mined from GenBank, mostly Edotis sorts of things. Um, 60 sequences or 60 individuals came from some unassembled genomes of Lentinula Edotis in the broad sense that were published in 2016 uh, from which we just extracted the ITS sequences. And I'll have more to say about those uh, 60 uh, unassembled lentinula genomes in a little bit. Um, so big picture, combining these data, we, we detect up to 13 groups, uh, five in Asia, Australasia, so the same five I talked about before, and up to eight in the Americas. So now we've got more 
um, resolution of lineages within the Americas. These are all candidate species um, and all pretty well supported um, by you know, the, the traditional measures, bootstrapping and so on. So I'll focus first on the Asian Australasian side. So again, I told you there are these same five groups that we've been seeing all along. Uh, group one from Borneo, lots of sequences from China, India, Japan, Korea, the Philippines, Thailand, um, the Russian Far East and Vietnam. Uh, group two, again, New Guinea, Australia. Group three, New Zealand, that's Lentinula Novi Zealandi. Uh, group four, the second group from New Guinea. And then this group five group from China, India, Nepal, and Vietnam, okay? So uh, group one and group five overlapping in terms of their geographic range. Um, so this is, this is a, um, uh, a simplified version of that tree I just showed you. This is the Asian Australasian group up here. And what you can see is that in this combined ITS-TEF1 data set, group one and group five are resolved as sister lineages, but with low bootstrap support uh, for their monophyly. But if we look at those two genes individually, um, ITS on its own doesn't put group one and group five as sister taxa or in the same clade. So they're just different ITS types, not a lot of support for the deeper nodes in the tree. Uh, and TEF1 alone doesn't discriminate those individuals at all. So they're just, if you saw a phylogram of this, it would just be one big completely unresolved comb with really no branch length within, within this group. So this made us scratch our heads and wonder if group one and group five were real. Um, and this is the uh, phylogenetic distribution, or excuse me, the geographic distribution of those groups. So group one and group five largely overlapping and group two and group four um, sympatric in New Guinea, as you've seen before. Um, Asia, Australasia, uh, Lentinula rafanica, Lentinula boreana, and Lentinula aciculospora all contain multiple lineages. Uh, this boreana species complex may include actually four independently evolving lineages that we might recognize um, as species. And you can see the distributions listed here. Uh, and then again, here's just the geographic distribution of these uh, putative species, ITS TF1 based lineages, uh, and some very provisional names for some of these uh, in, in this figure here. Okay, so with, so with more sampling, we're getting, um, we're getting more resolution of multiple lineages, particularly uh, in the Americas. Um, using the same data, we performed uh, some molecular clock analyses, uh, which suggest that this genus is roughly 50 million years old, you know, give or take. 10 or 15 million years on, on either side. So, uh, you know, take these with a grain of salt, but these are our approximate estimates of the age uh, of Lantinula. Um, we also looked at host range. So the, the word shiitake in Japanese means oak mushroom because they grow on oaks. And um, all 13 of these independently evolving lineages are recorded or likely to be on phagales um, except for Lantinula aciculospora, um, and then this group six of uh, Lantinula rafanica, which is on a very diverse group of hosts, um, all hardwoods, uh, but not phagaly. So based on this tree and this mapping of hosts, we think it's likely that the ancestral host of, Lent of Lantinula was phagaly's, uh, which is consistent with the age we get for, from the uh, molecular clock analysis. Okay, so, so summing up that, large phylogenetic analysis, we now think that there are about 13 lineages in Lantinula uh, that might warrant recognition um, as species with five in Asia, Australasia, um, and eight um, in the Americas. So next we're gonna to turn to phylogenomics. So this, this um, phylogenetic work using ITS and TEF1 provided a really nice framework to design a sampling scheme um, uh, for doing um, a genus level uh, genome um, based analysis. Um, so we've got a new set of collaborators uh, or a overlapping set of collaborators. Um, the genome sequencing was all done by the Joint Genome Institute in California, which has been uh, just a superb partner for my work uh, for many years. 
Um, Byung Nam Min was the main postdoc on that. Carrie Berry, who insisted I use this silly picture. This looks like an organism you might have in South Africa. Um, Carrie Berry was a project manager, and Igor Gregoriev is the head of the Fungal Genomes Initiative um, at the JGI. Um, and then these other folks are collaborators and friends. Uh, I'll point out Kazuhisa Tarashima from the Totori Mycological Institute, Ron Peterson, who I mentioned previously, and his former student, Juan Mata. Uh, Chris Smith is in New Zealand, and, and others who have been really helpful with this work. So we generated um, 25 new genomes, which represent 11 of the 13 groups based on ITS and TEF1 from 10 different countries. Uh, and then we imported four genomes, one Novi Zelandi genome and the rest all Edodes um, from, um, from, China, um, from China, Japan, uh, and, and Korea. Okay, so we really think we got a, a pretty broad sample of diversity in Lentinula based on everything we know from ITS, TF1, and also uh, biogeography, Pegler's monograph, and so on. So we obviously got all of Pegler's morpho species represented in the data set. Um, and if you wanna play with the data, they're all available on the JGI Microcosm website. And we're frantically trying to write up a paper now um, on this work. And so all the work I'm gonna present from this point on is, is not only unpublished, but we haven't finished <laughs> the analyses yet. So this is very much work in progress. And I will really welcome uh, your suggestions, your interpretations, your, your critical comments, because this work is not done. Um, this is Miguel Naranjo Ortiz, who is a postdoc in my lab right now, and he's been doing pan genome analysis in Lentinula, which I'm, I'm not going to go into any detail. Um, I'm showing you this slide mainly just to make the point that these Lentinula genomes are fairly typical for agaricomycetes, so you know, on the order of 34 to 49. Uh, megabases with about 12 to 16,000 genes um, per genome. So fairly, fairly typical um, agaricomycete genomes. Um, and Miguel has done a couple of sort of straight ahead phylogenomic analyses um, using uh, OrthoFinder as the main tool for scoring the, um, the ortho groups from which uh, the uh, genes are uh, pulled for doing phylogenetics. Um, Data set one includes a broad sample of outgroups from throughout the Agaricales. It upholds the placement of Lentinula within the Calibii Sensu, um, Sensu Pegler. Um, so this is data set one, which is the broad analysis across Agaricales. Data set two is more focused within Lentinula, and I'll, now I'll talk about what's in the tree. And basically it's really consistent with prior taxonomy. So we've got Lentinula rafanica, Lentinula boreana, um, and then in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the new world, um, Lentinula aciculospora from Costa Rica is up here, sister group to things from Asia, Australasia. So here's this group four from New Guinea. Here's just in this particular data set, there's just one isolate of Novi Zealandi from New Zealand, although we now have two. Um, Similarly, there's one isolate of Lateridia from Australia uh, in group two, but we have two of those now. Uh, and then two group five and two and four group one based on ITS. And in this analysis, they come out as monophyletic sister lineages, um, but that you'll see later is an artifact of low sampling. Um, one of the surprising results from this analysis, of course, is that Aciculospora from Costa Rica is not the sister group of the other things from the Americas as it was in the ITS trees. Uh, rather, it's the sister group, albeit on a very deep node, uh, to all the things in Asia, Australasia. And that's weird from a biogeographic perspective. So we, we tested the, that topology, used a bunch of different topology tests with data set one and data set two. And the bottom line is that the uh, the topology that we get that puts Aciculospora as a sister group of the Asian Australasian things is the only one that we can't reject. So we feel pretty confident that the closest relative of the Asian shiitake uh, or the Asian shiitake group um, is actually something that lives in Costa Rica and Ecuador, which is surprising. Um, and here is Aciculospora, which in this photo at least looks an awful lot uh, like uh, Lentinula edodes. Okay, now 
Next, we wanted to focus more intensely on uh, the Asian things, lentinula idodi sensu lato, because of course we're interested in the origins of cultivated shiitake mushrooms. Uh, and for this purpose, we were really fortunate to have access to these 60 genomes that Yang Xiao from Huazhong uh, uh, University in Wuhan had published. Um, and he had published this just as unassembled raw reads and had done some, some SNP analyses. Um, this is a figure from his 2016 paper, so kind of a while ago. Um, and we were able to, um, and, and Yang Xiao is now collaborating with us, uh, for which we're quite grateful. Um, but we, and when I say we, I mean Byungnam Min from JGI, um, was able to uh, get his unassembled data and assemble them into, into genomes with pretty good completeness based on Busco scores. So we were able to assemble those and start analyzing them. Um, and here's a phylogeny now of, of Lentinula uh, that includes 77 genomes, 56 from the Shao et al. study, um, and 19 from JGI. So this doesn't have every single genome we now have available. And then a couple of published things. Um, this topology is from a kind of quick and dirty concatenated single copy gene data set, uh, 415 genes analyzed with fast tree. We've done a bunch of other analyses of these data now, including species tree analyses using a program called Astral. And they all give us basically the same answer. Um, this group up here, this big group here, this is Lentinula idodes in the broad sense. So this is the group within which shiitake mushrooms, the shiitake mushrooms of, of commerce are nested. Um, and it's a little bit of a complicated slide. So let me just explain what you're looking at here. So the, the codes on the tips of the tree in red correspond to um, cultivars. So cult, uh, samples from cultivated shiitake mushrooms. Uh, those in blue, are wild collected strains. Um, and you can see that the cultivars and the wild things are kind of all mixed together in this group, which we call cultivars plus wild. This group down here is all wild strains. We call this the wild group. Uh, and then there's this group here that's, uh, that's got uh, uh, one cultivar recently cultivated and some wild things, which we call the mixed group. Um, so that's the distribution of cultivated versus wild collected strains uh, in Idodi sensulato. Then these G1, G5 notations on the right indicate the ITS type, the dominant ITS type that we um, either amplified with PCR or extracted from the raw uh, reads using sort of an in silico PCR type method. And what you can see is that um, group one and group five do not sort out as individual lineages. They're sort of all mixed, mixed together. Uh, and this wild group has many of these, has a bunch of G5 type ITSs scattered uh, within it. So this is, um, this is in conflict with the ITS-based analysis. The next thing that we turn to, and this is, by the way, this is the first time I've ever shown this figure in a talk. So this is, this is really brand new. These data actually, um, this is an analysis done by a postdoc in my lab, Brian Looney, and he gave me this figure last week. So I'm happy to share it with you now. Um, this is an analysis using a program called STACY, which is a Bayesian species delimitation program that models um, incomplete lineage sorting or it uses the coalescent in other words. And this is based on 50 um, single copy genes um, uh, used to generate uh, this, 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 this tree. Um, and then the STACY program uh, estimates what are the likely uh, independent lineages, which may correspond to species, taking into account coalescence. Um, and we're gonna focus only on this big square down here, which is idodes in the broad sense, so lentinul idodes sensu lato. So here is the wild group, which contains G1 and G5 type ITS. Here is the cultivars plus wild group, which is only G1. And this is the mixed group in the middle. So again, with only G1 ITS. So I'll just go back to that tree really quick so you can see there's wild, mixed, cultivars plus wild. And, and so here they are again, wild, mixed, and cultivars plus wild. So this analysis suggests that there are at least two independently evolving lineages um, in Lentinula idodi sensulato, taking into account 
um, incomplete lineage sorting. Now, Stacy analyses are sensitive to a setting called the collapse height, which is basically has to do with the depth at which genes coalesce are allowed to coalesce uh, within, uh, within a, a discrete lineage, if I'm explaining that properly. Um, and what this figure shows you is a bunch of different Stacy runs uh, at different collapse heights. Uh, so this would, you know, down on the lower right, this is closest to the figure I just showed you, and it's most inclusive, right? So it's going to give you bigger groups, so allowing genes to coalesce deeper in the history of the species. On the upper left, it's a more restrictive uh, collapse height, so it's going to start to parse out many more independent lineages. So it's kind of... Um, there is an element of subjectivity to deciding at what point you have um, results that correspond to what you might consider species. Um, based on you know, calibrating with respect to other, I would say, well delimited species like Novi Zelandi, I'm most comfortable with this delimitation, which is why this is the one I focused on first. But what you can see is that the, um, the wild group um, has more genetic diversity um, the, uh, the gene, then the cultivars group, uh, the, 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 um, the gene, gene lineages coalesce more, deeper in the tree, whereas in the cultivars plus wild group, they coalesce more quickly, indicating, suggesting that there's just less genetic uh, diversity. Um, but this is all, you know, so this is a, an interesting method that takes into account incomplete lineage sorting, um, but it's still very much doing a, uh, a gene-based phylogenetic analysis, right? So we wanted to um, go to the, take a more sort of population level approach um, and look at SNPs. So look at single nucleotide polymorphisms within Edodi sensulato. So for that purpose, we used admixture to sample about 10,000 SNPs. Um, and uh, we estimated the optimal number of populations at two. Um, and then we made a, a tree using splits tree, which is a sort of a, a, a network type analysis. And so what you've got here, here's the wild group, here's the cultivars group, and then here's the mixed group, which appears to be very much an admixed group uh, between the cultivars and the wild group. So our interpretation right now is that the mixed group probably represents hybridization or introgression or something involving the cultivars plus wild clade and the wild group. And my inference is that this represents um, uh, contamination of wild populations from uh, shiitake farms, which of course have incredibly high density of fruiting bodies and produce massive amounts of spores which go into the air. So this is, this is of conservation um, relevance for sure. Um, one last thing about ITS, um, when we look at the individual reads uh, for the ITS uh, in, say, the Shao genomes, um, what we find is that there's a lot of polymorphism. So we're just starting to work up these data now, but it's pretty clear to us that there's intragenomic heterogeneity in ITS um, in some of these things that have uh, appear to have group five ITS. So we interpret that as probably some kind of ancient polymorphism that is just sorting out in, in unpredictable ways. Okay, so phylogenomics, the conclusions here are that the genome data really do largely support the ITS-TEF1 phylogeny with some exceptions. One is that Aceculospora, the thing from Costa Rica, looks like it's the sister group of all Asian Australasian things. Um, ITS group one and group five are not supported as independent lineages, so limits to ITS-based species limitation. Idodi sensulato contains at least two lineages that I think might warrant recognition as species, which correspond to this wild and cultivars plus wild group. Um, the mixed group may be some kind of hybrid or intergressed population. Um, more to come on that later. Um, and then there's intragenomic heterogeneity in ITS that might reflect some kind of maintained polymorphism, but we're still figuring that out. Okay, so finally, um, I wanna tell you about some outstanding mysteries and I, I need, I apologize, I have to throw you a curve um, and tell you about Lentinula in Africa, um, which I, I have sort of misled you up to this point by suggesting that Lentinula is only in Asia, Australasia and the Americas. And I, I apologize, I hope I haven't violated your, your trust. Um, so you'll recall that 
we thought there were 13 lineages of Lanchenula that may warrant recognition as species, five in Asia, Australasia, eight in the Americas, or so we thought. Um, a few years ago, actually quite a few years ago, Bart Bike, who's in Paris, uh, in the course of a survey of edible mushrooms in Madagascar, found a fungus that he said was a shiitake lookalike. So he thought it was Lentinula idotes or something very quick, uh, similar. I overlooked this paper for many years, found it, freaked out, asked Bart for samples. He sent me some very tiny pieces of the herbarium <laughs> specimens. Um, and my postdoc, Brian, got large subunit data, uh, which very strongly placed it with this Madagascar thing within Lentinula, within the Omphalotaceae, which is the broader family in Agaricales. Uh, he also then got ITS and TEF1, which suggests that it is, here it is up here, we're calling it Lentinula madagascarensis, which based on these data anyway, come out as a sister group of Aciculospora in Costa Rica and Ecuador. Um, and so we've just published this in the journal Fuse, Fungal Systematics and Evolution. Uh, this was in the title slide for the whole talk. You might've looked at this and thought it was shiitake because it really kind of is a shiitake lookalike. So at least one lentinula in what is at least politically Africa. Um, but it's not the, and, and if so, that's a 4,000 mile range extension uh, for the genus. But this is, turns out, probably is not the only lentinula in Africa, because if you go to the website of the Mysa Botanic Garden in Belgium, here's something that they report from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They're still calling it lentinula idodes, um, but we'll see. And we're in contact with them about doing some work together. Um, and it does not look like Madagascar carensis. So it, I think it's a different, different species in Africa. So... I would bet that these two are gonna turn out to be closely related, um, but even if they are, uh, there's prob we probably have to invoke long distance dispersal to get Lantinula to Madagascar, because I believe Lantinula Madagascar has been separated from the African continent for something like 150 million years, much older than the genus based on our molecular clock analyses. Um, other mysteries, something called Lantinula platinidotes has been reported from Vietnam, this is the, the data are not available. This is large subunit. We don't know, uh, but it may be another lineage in South, in, in Vietnam. And in this tree, at least it comes out close to the uh, things in the Americas. So interesting. And then there is the most mysterious of all, Lentinula huarapiensis described by Spegazzini. Here's a picture of one of the um, uh, Exacati specimens. Doesn't look like a Lentinula to me, but who am I to question the great Pegler? So we'll, we'll see, someday maybe we can get some DNA out of this. Okay, so I think a general message here from this work, uh, well, there are a couple general messages. One is that um, international collaboration is really fun and rewarding and can be incredibly productive. Uh, so I wanna thank all of my collaborators and everybody who supplied material uh, to this project. And the other me general message is that even in one of the world's best known genera of mushrooms. There are still a lot of mysteries, uh, still a lot of surprises. Uh, the diversity of Lentinula in Africa is probably greater, I would guess, than just these two things. Um, perhaps one of you in the audience will, um, will find the next species of Lentinula in Africa. And with that, um, I will stop and I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much for a, a wonderful talk, David, particularly going from, you know, I guess, the, the, the taxonomy and, and morphology through to certainly where we've been, you know, one gene, a couple of genes, and then, wow, you have the, the, the whole genome so, and, and some of what actually can be done. Um, yeah. I, I, have, I have a couple of questions. Um, but I do see that Nicola has put in, in the chat line a question that I thought I, I would start with. Um, and what she's saying is with regards to the potential hybrid that you have in that um, Chinese-Japanese grouping, the, in, in, the introgressed mixed group, would you generate artificial hybrids to examine their genomes? I guess it's going back to the fact that when you were talking about the earlier work um, that you were doing in Japan, that it was known that you could actually 
across these different groups? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I, let, before I answer that question, let me just comment back on your comment. You know, Brenda, you're right. I mean, we have been so fortunate. I mean, when I say we, I mean you and I and many others that we've really lived through um, two major revolutions in systematics, right? Uh, the initial molecular revolution and now the genomic revolution. And at every step, you know, just a, a quantitative change in how we understand our things. So yeah, it's been great. Um, yeah, that's a really good question from Nicola. Um, I guess what I would say is I think that the artificial hybrids have already been produced and that's what's in this mixed group. So they're, I, I, that's my inference that, that that is what they are, that they are hybrids or, or something. Um, uh, certainly one could do um, crossing in the lab and, and make hybrids of anything in Asia, Australasia, except this group four from New Guinea, right? So group four from New Guinea is reproductively isolated from all, or at least partly reproductively isolated from everything else. But the rest, the rest they, they mate. And I mean, I think that just really illustrates the, the great weakness and the, you know, the sort of mating criterion for species delimitation. You know, the, the Asian Australasian group is fairly young and it has, those populations have retained this plesiomorphic ability to mate. Um, so that's not really in my book, a good criterion for recognizing lineages. Um, yeah, you could, you could make all kinds of interesting crosses and then do genomics and see, um, and do functional genomics and see what happens next. Um, that's wide open. So in actual fact, you, you, you've answered the question. One of the questions that I wanted to ask was your, your, your take on using crossing the ability to mate um, with regards to delineating species. So I'm not going to ask that question. I could see that um, Tuan would like to ask a question. So I'm going to pass over to Tuan. Uh, thank you, Brenda. And thank you very much, David, for a very interesting talk. So I have a question connected to that hybrid mixed group in the middle. So if we recognize the first group and the bottom group, the Y and the Y cultivated group as species, how should we treat the hybrid? Because from what I see is that they actually seem to be there's a coherent image, there's a few, there's a diversity in them, and they also have their own state. So are they become a species? Should we treat them as a species or should we treat them as a hybrid uh, entity? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know. Nature is nature is frustrating sometimes because we have these nice categories that we would like to put things into, and then uh, things turn out to be messy. Um, uh, I mean, right now my interpretation is that these look like. Um, I mean, it looks like there's they are hybrids of two independent lineages. Um, that's my interpretation right now. Um, we're doing some um, some phylogenetic network analyses to try to see if we can detect introgression and directionality and preliminary results suggest that you know the scenario I described in words is what what, what is happening um, if you're asking about taxonomy um, I'm not sure exactly what is the optimal way to go but I I tend to think that you know your species level taxonomy often reflects um, you know what you know and 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 how much you care. <laughs> so I mean, we care a lot about Lentinula idodis sensu lato because it's economically important and so on. So I would be in favor of formalizing those uh, one of the, the the wild group as a new species because I think that would potentially raise awareness about um, genetic diversity um, and be a the risk to the native populations that the shiitake farms pose. Um, so yeah, just decisions about species delimitation, I think those are some of the hardest in science. And I think that they have a, um, I don't know, a political dimension or a practical dimension. You know, this is a really important group of cultivated mushrooms and we could, you know, we could communicate our understanding of that genetic diversity to the rest of humanity um, most effectively, I think, if we just gave it a new species name, you know, because most, most like shiitake farmers and conservation people and so on, you know, they don't want to talk about coalescence and introgression and stuff like that. But if you say this is a different species, <laughs> they get that. Um, so, 
I would favor that based on what we know now. But as far as those hybrids, should they be taxonomically recognized? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And, and I'm still not 100% certain that they are, in fact, hybrids and not some kind of um, po polymorphic population that's just retained some ancestral diversity. I think that's less likely. But I'll tell you, I'm, I'm much, you know, for me, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a system, systematist. I'm most comfortable at, at the level of gene trees and big phylogenies. So when you get down to population level stuff and introgression and all that, it's, um, it's challenging for me. Thank you. Yeah, Sydney, the, the one question I have is within the group that includes the cultivated species, do you have any evidence that you've got some gene flow from that other species? Um, yeah. Um, we, so as I was mentioning just a minute ago, we, we have, well, first of all, we have that, the, the SNP-based admixture analyses, which suggest that there are, uh, you know, if K equals two, that's the optimal number of populations with some admixture between them. Um, and we're starting to do these network analyses, which make it look like there has been some introgression from the wild plus cultivated group to the wild group. Um, one of the problems with you know, anything, any, any Edotes that you collect in the wild in Northeast Asia in particular could easily be an escaped cultivar. So just because you found something in the wild doesn't mean that it's indigenous. Um, yeah. No, it's fascinating. I mean, and certainly what does come to mind is the e example of, it's the silkworm, Bombyx, is it suggested that it's no longer alive in the wild, you know, and, and, and can one say the same of, of shiitake, um, or the, the, the cultivated one, it seems like it is very much alive in the, in the wild, so maybe the selection um, for cultivation hasn't been quite as strong to remove it from the wild. Yeah, so something we'd really like to get into is look at domestication, you know, the see if we can see some genetic signatures of domestication, because my, my read on shiitake, which is not very well informed is that it's sort of semi-domesticated. It's really not that far from its from the wild strains. So it's not like uh, you know, it's not like wine yeast or 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 cows or something something like that. You know, or wheat. Um, um, yeah. Don't, don't even get me started on the wine yeast as a as a domestic organism. Um, you know, you were talking about where you started your PhD. That's where I started my PhD was on wine yeasts. Um, so I see Nicola, in fact, maybe I, I should just mention to, to the audience here, and um, I've, I've kind of stopped counting. I think we got up to, um, was it 120? Sorry, I'm looking at Mary yeah. here. Um, we got up to 120 people who, who were listening online. So I've, I've lost track a little bit of um, who's online with us. And Farnas has suggested that if people have questions they can put up their hands but it's quite difficult to to check the hands um, but it's easier if people actually write things in the chat box and Nicola has also written thanks for the great talk David I agree completely about the difficulty and political nature of species recognition and I work on groups that have much less economic importance but perhaps in angiosperms we can have a lot more morphological characteristics that we can use so yeah, tax, taxonomy, if I can just editorialize for a second, taxonomy is definitely political. And I think uh, we systematists need to kind of own that and just be aware of um, that we are part of the real world and, and how you name things matters. Uh, I think there's a very interesting discussion that's come up recently about uh, the use of indigenous names in taxonomy. Um, you know, one of the things that kind of bothers me about Lentinula idotes is that it was named by the Reverend M.J. Berkeley based on material that was collected from a shop in Japan. And it's been known as shiitake or shangu or pyogo for many centuries in Asia. And so why should it be idotes? Um, you know, when there were pre-existing names uh, used by the people who live where the thing comes from. Um, so that's an interesting discussion that's starting to happen in, in systematics right now. Um, 
Yeah. I, I was going to say this sounds like this would go completely against the code. What you're almost suggesting is 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 a renaming of things. I mean, this this. This? It would be a. It would be another. It, it it could be incorporated in the code. Um, it would just have to be explicit as a as a valid criterion for conservation, you know. And um, and given the conservative nature of the uh, botanical nomenclature community, I, I I don't see that happening in our lifetimes. But maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> it's a. It's an interesting idea. I'm. I'm. So a bit mindful of time at the moment, um, and I'm seeing another comment from um, Carlos Rodas, who's um, actually logged on from Colombia, and Carlos is saying thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, and he's wondering how, what the population in Colombia looks like for this interesting group, and from, from what you're saying, I don't know, do you have Colombian Iceland? Um, I don't think I have any, oh, do we have Colombian isolates? I don't think we do. Um, thank you, Carlos, for the question. Um, I have been, I mean, one, there's a really, there's a really strong group of fungal, there's a really strong fungal taxonomy community in South America. My primary collaborators uh, are in Brazil, Noemia and, um, and Nelson. Um, but I've been talking to some folks in Colombia as well. Lentinula certainly is in Colombia. Um, Rafanica is there for sure. Aciculospora may be there. Um, I think that's a place, I mean, throughout, <laughs> throughout South America where just more field work and basic taxonomy uh, is really needed. But Lentinula is most assuredly in Colombia. I've seen lots of pictures, you know, these days, people put pictures on the web on all kinds of websites, Mushroom Observer and so on. Um, so for sure it's there. And um, uh, a, a field survey in South America would be, would be great. Well, I'm sure Carlos would, would, would love to host you in Colombia. <laughs> Carlos um, spends a lot of time in plantations and I'm sure he sees a lot of very interesting mushrooms. But I am yeah. going to no, sorry, Dave. No, just that they're typically at in 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 the tropics. They're typically at elevation, uh, usually um, on various angiosperms. But but I'd be happy to talk further later. I think we can we can. I I, I I'm now speaking for you, David, but I'm sure you'd be um, very interested in engaging with anybody in this group if they have any further questions. Or, or want to send you some pictures or, or even mushrooms. I, I, I'm sure that you would be very happy. <laughs> I'd be really happy. And I really, I mean, Africa, I mean, there, there's there got to be a lot more Lentinula in Africa. I mean, I don't know when when it's going to, I don't know how easy it is to go to the Democratic Republic of the Congo for field work these days, but uh, that would be great. Um, it, it, I would say that it's not exactly a walk in the park. <laughs> So do I hand over to Merriman yes. now? Okay, Farnas, we're going to hand over to you. Um, we're going to ask Bernard just to um, do the final um, word of thanks for David, and then we will hand, uh, continue. Right. Farnas, you want me to do it now? Yeah. Yes. All right, sure, David. Yeah, what a, what a pleasure to listen to you, to uh, sort of walk this historical uh, route with you and, and also seeing how the systematics of this group and, and reflecting on how that's changed for mycology in general, but, but also more broadly. And as you say, what, what an exciting, uh, yeah, new uh, time of discovery and, and understanding lies ahead for us. And you've raised, raised so many tantalizing and interesting questions, everything from the naming to the diversity and, and speaking to all of our desires to get out in the field uh, in, in many different places of the world and collect. And, and we look forward to doing some of that with you somewhere in the future. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk, stimulating uh, many thoughts and ideas for us. We look forward to continuing this discussion with you. And we'll see you again soon. And until then, I, ho I hope you stay safe. Okay, th thank you. Thank you, Bernard and everybody. It's It's been really fun and I'm, I think I'm sticking around for a couple of couple more presentations, right? Yes. So um, from the society side, I also would like to thank you for being our international invited speaker. And 
now we will move over to our two local um, presentations. And Vilma Nell would be the first one. She is a PhD candidate, but I've seen today that they are already organizing a prestige seminar, we tell, which tells me that her reviews came in and that she would soon be Dr. Vilma Nell. But um, over to you, Vilma. Uh, thank you, Faunus. Can everybody hear me and see my screen fine? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, so hello everyone, and thank you for still being online with us today. Um, and thank you to Farnes and the Society for allowing me to present. And today I am going to tell you a story about some of Ophiostomatelis fungi we found in a very interesting place. Uh, going. So my story starts with a collaboration that was formed between FABI and researchers from the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands and the University of Copenhagen from Denmark. And this um, collaboration was led by Professors Dur Arnen and Michael Paulsen. And it was aimed at looking at the microbial diversity associated with fungus growing termites and their mounts. Now the fungus growing termites are one of three insect groups that are considered true fungus farmers as they cultivate and maintain fungal crops within their nests. And these fungi that they cultivate belong to the Basidiomyces genus Timitomyces. And they maintain this fungi as combs in the subterranean parts of their nests. To ensure nothing happens to their food source, the termites actively tend the combs to keep them free of parasitic microbes. But as soon as you remove the termites, parasites do move into the system and we often find other fungi cultivating these combs. And what was interesting to us was that after a few months of removing the termites from the comb and them not having to tend the termitomyces, a few stomatoid structures started to appear. Um, some of you might be familiar with one of the more famous species of Ophiostomatoid fungi, Ophiostoma ulmi, which is responsible for Dutch elm disease, and it's vectored by the small bark beetle between hosts. Like Ophiostoma ulmi, many Ophiostomatoid fungi are primarily found on woody hosts, and they are vectored by bark and ambrosia beetles, as well as the mites that they vector. However, we've been finding some species in more unique places. So we've found them in protea and fructuses. There are human opportunistic um, pathogens and even some nematode associated species, but none so far have been discovered in any way associated with termites. Unfortunately, throughout the years since their discovery, there has been a long history of taxonomic confusion within the Ophiostomatoid fungi. And we use the term Ophiostomatoid to collectively refer to two different families, the Ophiostomataceae and the Sororicistidaceae, because these two families produce very similar sexual and asexual structures. During the time of morphological species description, uh, the, one of the only ways to distinguish between species from these different families was based on their sensitivity to the fungicide cyclohexamide. And so species of Ophiostomataceae were found insensitive to cyclohexamide and could grow in its presence. And species from the Serotocystidaceae were sensitive to cyclohexamide and cannot grow in its presence. But since DNA sequencing was introduced, it became much easier to differentiate between the species um, in their respective families. And it was shown that these families are not closely related, but reside in different orders of the Sideromycetes and that the similarities in their structures is likely a result of convergent evolution due to the similar types of habitats that they share. But um, most of these um, species that we find in more interesting locations reside in the Ophiostomataceae family and the Ophiostomatales order. And so we wondered if these structures on the termite fungus combs belong to new Ophiostomatalian species. And to determine if this were the case, we followed a very conventional approach. I picked single spore drops from the sexual structures and transferred them onto Ophiostomatale specific media containing cyclohexamide. And then from the colonies that grew on this media, I transferred hyphal tips 
until I obtained pure cultures. Then I extracted DNA, did PCR and sequencing and phylogenetic analysis for three different gene regions. And I also looked at the morphology of the fungi. Now, following this conventional phylogenetic approach, I ran into some conflicting results. In the LSU phylogeny, the isolates separated into two distinct lineages, and both these lineages grouped close to the genus Ophiostoma. So for the ITS and beta tubulin data, we focused our analysis around, the Ophi around Ophiostoma as well. But in these phylogenies, instead of grouping within the genus, our isolates fell basal to the genus. Additionally, the isolates representing lineage B that grouped as a single lineage in the LSU phylogeny separated into close sister lineages in both of these um, analyses. And we also found that for the beta two tubulin gene region, it had different exon intron compositions. So for lineage B1, it only contained intron five and for lineage B2, it contained intron three and five. So based on these um, single gene phylogenies, we were quite confident in the amount of species we were working with, but we weren't sure about their higher level taxonomic placement in the family. So we decided to do additional gene sequencing and we included the elongation factor one alpha gene. We did sequencing for the RPB2 region. And then we also did family level phylogenetic analysis for the ITS data that we had generated. And in each of these different phylogenies our isolates grouped at different locations. So for elongation factor one alpha, again, the isolates grouped closer to species of Ophiostoma. For RPB2, they grouped close to species of Sporophrix. And for the ITS, they grouped basal to all the genera in the family. So because these conventional methods weren't really were helping us to resolve the higher level taxonomic placement, we instead decided to take a genomics approach. So we selected one isolate from each lineage A and B and extracted their DNA and sent this off for sequencing. And after assembling the genome data, we found something very interesting for lineage A. So where the genomes of species from the Ophiostomatales so far sequenced range between 19.5 megabases and around 44 megabases, the genome for isolate A or the isolate from lineage A was only 16 megabases in size, which is quite a bit smaller. So we just double checked the completeness of um, the genomes using Busco and they were fairly complete. So we were happy moving forward with them. And at this moment, we have genome sequences for species from 11 of the 12 described genera in the Ophiostomatales. So we could take a phylogenomic approach to determine their higher level classification. And we chose two methods of phylogenomic analysis. The first approach was super matrix analysis. And in this type of analysis, one extracts all the core shared genes between the different species genomes, and then use these to perform a genome scale multi-local multi sequence analysis. So we take those um, core shared genes, concatenate them into one large supermatrix data set, and then we moved on with maximum likelihood analysis. The second approach we followed was super tree analysis. And in this case, instead of concatenating all the individual data sets, one performs phylogenetic analysis for each data set. And then you superimpose all the different topologies of the individual gene phylo phylogenies and extract the most accurate representative phylogeny from that. So we used three different applications of these methods for the super matrix we performed maximum likelihood analysis using RAXML. And we used two different super tree algorithms. The first was STAG and the second was Astral. And we just did the different methods to compare if there were large differences in topologies generated when using the different phylogenomics approaches. Um, there were a few differences between the phylogenies, but overall they were quite similar. And in all cases, both our lineages Group within the Ophiostomatales family close to Ophiostoma, but they grouped as distinct generic lineages. So we were confident to describe them as new genera. I then also looked at the morphology for the three species lineages. For lineage A, like its genome, its morphology was also quite unique. And 
In this case, it produces golden brown sexual structures, where other Ophiostomatales species typically produce dark brown to black sexual structures. And these structures also maintain the flexibility in their necks throughout their lives. Um, whereas with most Ophiostomatales, they become rigid and they break quite easily. And then for the two sister species for lineage B, we could confirm morphologically what we saw in the phylogenies as well with lineage B1 producing a single asexual state with ovovoid conidia, and lineage B produces both this sexual state or asexual state, sorry, as well as a second asexual stage characterized by round conidia. And based on all of these results, we then introduced two new genomes, Chrysotheria and Antibia, and we introduced the species Chrysotheria yanellii to represent lineage A, Intubia macrotomatonerum to represent lineage B1, and Intubia ulamantiae to represent lineage B2. And so to conclude my story, new and interesting species can be found in some of the most unexpected of places as long as you look for them. And currently morphology and DNA sequences are still a very powerful tool in taxonomy, but when it comes to the higher level classification of some genera, these tools alone might no longer be powerful enough to provide clear answers. But with more genomes becoming available, phylogenomic analysis can become a powerful tool in addressing questions like these. And without our phylogenomic analysis, we would likely have incorrectly described these species in the genus of Theostoma. Lastly, I would just like to acknowledge um, all of the different funding bodies, um, Professors Dur Arnen and Michael Paulson, Professor Brenda Wingfield, who supplied the funding for the genome sequencing, and Mrs. Miranda Proctor, who shared her data during all those different phylogenetic analyses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vilma. Um, I think we have a bit of time just to ask one or two questions. We will afterwards also allow people to ask questions. So please, if you have any questions, there's nothing I've seen in the um, chat line, but um, if you want to, just raise your hand. Maybe can I can I ask a question? Yes, Brenda. The one's got good control. Who's controlling the, the camera here? This is excellent. Um, Wilma, thank you. That was a really lovely, lovely presentation, and. I mean, you serve to focus my mind maybe a little bit more on these fungi. What do you think about the fact that that one genome is so much smaller? If I remember rightly, that's the one that has the funny beta tubulum sequence as well. Yes, yes, it does. So um, initially when we found these fungi, because they're occurring basically on the body of a different fungus, we considered that they might be um, mycoparasitic and so we did a few tests with them and so for the two species um, in Intubia we, we didn't really find any results but for this one species um, with the small genome it does appear to derive some benefit from the um, tomatomyces as well so it might be actually gaining something from growing on the other fungus and because of that it might also have led to a reduction in its genome because it doesn't have to produce all of its own compounds because it's getting it from the nutrients um, that it's breaking down. Yeah, if that makes really, sense. Really interesting. Thank you. Any other questions that you would like to ask, Vilma? Well, you still have time to think about that um, so because we. Yes, um, David. Yeah. Um, just really cool talk. Um, and I, I was just wondering if you had thought about looking into like the uh, CASI profiles or anything, get some, any clues on the functional biology of, of these things? I mean, the phylogeny aside, and, and, I mean, any ideas about how they make a living? Um, so I've looked at a few um, different protein coding genes. So I've looked at the Kazon profiles and the secondary metabolites, but they, they do look relatively similar to some of the other Ophiostomatales that I've compared them to, but I think I, I do need to go deeper and figure out what's going on because something's interesting there. Okay, there's another question from Nicola, 
and she's asking, um, you know, thinking of um, Ulmi, uh, you know, which is a potential tree pathogen, are there any indications that these fungi could be found outside of the termite nests, especially on living plant material? Um, so I guess it could be possible, but we haven't, there's no really closely related species to these ones that we found. Um, so it might be something to look into in future, but at this stage, we haven't found them anywhere else except in the termite mounds. Okay, Mike, you wanted to ask a question. I was just telling you, Forrest, that there were questions in the chat box. Uh, oh, okay. I, that I, I, have, I have a second, and I know you want to move on to the next talk. And David, again, thanks for a fabulous talk. So Wilma, um, yeah, there must be more of these. More, more there, there are many termites, many species of termites. Uh, what do you think about that? Are we going I think to, we need to uh, dig up um, some more termite mounds and go find them. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there, there, there must be they many. So mm -hmm. How, how, no, how do they get there? They're not being carried by the termites, so how do they get there? Yeah, so the, uh, we thought about the, it being on the substrate that the termites carry in, but if you look at the process of these fungus growing termites, they don't just take the material into their mounds, they actually eat the material and then digest it and then deposit it into the termite mounds for the termitomyces. So if the termites are taking it into their nest, it actually has to survive the guts of the termite, which would be quite amazing as well. Or there are mites that are associating with the termites or with the rest mm. of it. Yes, but it's definitely interesting to go and explore. Well, that's the beauty of science, that there's always a lot more to do. And I always say that the one thing about us is we can never be, um, you can be wrong. You know, you can say, sorry, I made a mistake. And the other thing is there's always something new. So those are the two joys of being a scientist. But let's move on. And um, Aiden, we would like to hear your talk now. As I say, afterwards, we will also allow some time for um, questions. And thanks to Vilma for a very nice talk. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Aidan Pasahi, and I'm going to be presenting you to you today about my master's work, which had to do with the isolation and identification of penicillium from wheat-associated agricultural soils. Penicillium is a genus of Ascomycetes fungi, which occurs worldwide in a variety of different environments. This genus is typically characterized by their brush-like conidiophore structure and exhibit a large rate of species discovery with over 120 new species being discovered between 2014 and 2020. Penicillium play an important ecological role as saprophytes and as nutrient sources for soil living organisms such as mites and nematodes. Um, they play an important medical role as sources of new antibiotics such as penicillin, which is the most well-known example. Uh, they play an important agricultural role both as post-harvest pathogens such as P. digitatum and P. expansum and as phosphate solubilizing or plant growth promoting microbes such as P. bilayae. South Africa is also a known biodiversity hotspot for penicillium, particularly the Cape Floristic region or the Fainbos biome, with several new species having been described um, in this biome. And the most recent uh, that was also isolated in this project was Penicillium alsopiae. And it's mentioned specifically because a very large amount of it was isolated in this study, and we used it for a potting trial later in the study. So the methods of identification in penicillium are morphological, physiological, and phylogenetic in nature, and a combination of these methods is used when describing new species as the currently accepted species concept in penicillium is a polyphasic species concept. So when looking at morphological classification, I'm going to just show you guys pictures of a novel species which I found during this work, which belongs to section Rolfsiorum, uh, a series Rolfsiorum of section Lenart de Vericata. Um, as you can see, the morphology changes drastically dependent on the media that you put it on. So we look at a variety of different media when we're noting morphological characteristics and you note all visible morphological characteristics. Um, we also look at thermotolerance in this genus <clears throat> as it can be very taxonomically informative um, because the temperature has a very large influence on the growth rate and the morphology of these uh, fungi. Um, 
when we do micromorphological classification, it involves the examination of the conidiophores, or the asexual reproductive structures. These uh, pictures to the right are pictures of my novel species, um, which I found, and its notable features are a lack of metulae and a lack of a subterminal branch. It is also sclerotogenic. And the reason why the subterminal branch is noteworthy is because that is what distinguishes it from its closest phylogenetic uh, relative. So phylogenetic analysis in penicillium is done primarily using four genes, ITS, beta tubulin, RPB2, and comodulin. ITS has weak resolution within certain sections of these genes, so may not necessarily resolve to species level. Um, so therefore, we chose beta tubulin as the primary marker. And when the species was in doubt or when a new species was being described, we did the additional gene sequences to perform multi-gene phylogeny um, for GCPSR, or genealogical concordance of phylogenetic species recognition. Um, these are just examples of uh, this comodulin tree, RPB2 tree, and a Ben-A tree, and then the concatenated tree where P. alsopia was described, um, which is the novel species that I used for my potting trial, as we saw a very large amount of the species um, in wheat growing fields, uh, which is strange considering that it is supposed to be a native Feinbos strain or species. And this is my concatenated phylogeny, phylogenetic tree, which shows that my uh, strain, which is morphologically distinct from P. pulvalorum, also with very high phylogenies, um, is phylogenetically distinct from P. pulvalorum. The physiological analyses I did not get to do in my study, but how it is performed is by growing up the fungal strains of penicillium on CYA and YES media, after which extra lights are extracted from these strains, and then a HBLC profile is generated using this extraction. These HBLC profiles are species specific, so it can be very useful for taxonomic classification. In the study, we focus on agricultural soil environments from three different farms, which differ mainly in uh, either crop rotation or soil composition, the sampling sites. The classification in the study, as I mentioned before, used mainly beta tubulin, unless looking at potentially novel species. And morphological classifications were done to provide the additional data to verify the phylogenetic um, classifications. Plant growth promotion activity was also examined. So we looked at indole production and phosphate solubilization activity on uh, plates. And we noted very weak activity of the weak of the in, indole acetic acid production plates and very high phosphate solubilizing plates, uh, phosphate solubilizing activity. So we chose based on the phosphate solubilizing activity, five organisms for a potting trial. They belong to the five species as listed in front of you, P. alsopiae, P. corvianum, P. mercianum, P. belaiae, and P. polonicum. The potting trials were performed by applying three concentrations of fertilizer at a full commercial dose, half commercial dose, and quarter commercial dose. And the negative control and treatments were supplemented with inorganic phosphate analogous to the amount of uh, fertilizer applied to the positive control. Um, the organisms used for the potting trials were grown on a modified PVK medium as this induces phosphatase activity. We made spore suspensions and then we standardized these spore suspensions and applied this organism at a level of 5.7 times 10 to the power of seven spores per milliliter to the uh, seeds of the wheat seeds, after which the wheat seeds were planted and left for three months. And so just going to give you guys a quick overview of the diversity results and the potting trial results. So what we noted is that with the wheat wheat crop rotations, there was a far higher instance of aspergillus and there was a far fewer, uh, there was a net reduction in the amount of fungus which were isolated. Um, the wheat medics also had contained P penicillium alsopiae and penicillium nov. Uh, so it had both the novel species, uh, but the wheat wheat did not. So it indicates that the monoculture is selecting against these novel species. Um, the wheat canola was by far the most diverse. And um, yeah, for the three farms, we noticed that Teichwik was by far the most diverse and uh, followed closely by Langevens. Um, the notable difference being that Teichwik had a far higher number of fungal isolates as it was more nutrient rich. And Hopefield was by far the most nutrient poor and the most well drained. So it had very, very low amounts of diversity and low amounts of fungal isolates. In the potting trials, we saw there was no significant difference for the shoot length between the species and a very small effect seen 
for the plant yield of the species. And of all of the treatments, the initial fungal strain was successfully re-isolated except for treatment five. Um, so P. polonicum strain, which was applied, did not survive till the harvest. We saw significant differences in root weight and volume between the negative control and treatments one through four, whereas five had no difference. And the positive control interestingly showed no significant difference in root weight or volume when examining the lowest and the highest dosages, but it did at the middling intermediate dosage of inorganic phosphate. And um, one interesting thing to note is if uh, you look at 1H1, uh, the circles there, it shows that although the root weight of one of the first treatment at the higher inorganic phosphate dosage did not massively increase, or for treatment three, the root weight actually decreased, there was a very large increase in volume, which means that at this higher increase, at this higher dosage of phosphate, there was a far higher degree of root branching. So there's far more root volume being formed, indicating that this fungus was having some form of positive association with the wheat plants. So in conclusion, crop rotations and farming practice impact penicillium diversity. Novel species of penicillium are likely to be found from many habitats, including agricultural, which we don't necessarily think of as a diverse environment. Um, and some of the native fungal strains isolated show the ability to influence plant root growth, particularly wheat root growth, which is uh, interesting because it means that the wheat successfully associated with what is supposed to be a native fungal strain, and large numbers of this native fungal strain were so isolated in this study uh, from all three different crop rotations. So it does appear as if it is successfully associating with commercial crops in some way. Um, I'd like to thank the following people. And are there any questions? Thank you very much, Aidan. Um, I forgot to, to say that um, Aidan is a um, MSc student at the University of Stellenbosch. Um, and thank you very much for being willing to to um, present today. And I see there are some clapping of hands because there's no real audience that can do anything. So um, um, Nicola has got a, um, a question. Thanks for your talk. I learned a lot. In particular, I had not known that the CFR had high penicillium diversity. I especially enjoyed the beautiful images of your new species. So she's um, giving you a compliment. Any well, thank you very person much. that would like to ask a question to Aiden? You can just indicate. Sometimes it's easier to speak than to um, um, Brenda. So, I mean, I'm, we can't let Aiden off the hook here without any questions. <laughs> Aiden, you're a master's student and you describe for the first time a new species. How do you feel about that? It's, it's strange because it's so interesting to me that no one's seen it before. You know, I think that was, that was quite a cool moment sitting in front of the microscope and looking at it and taking the image and realizing like, I'm the first person to have seen this. So it's, it's a wonderful experience. Um, I think it really made me, it, it drew me more into the field. Uh, than what I was when I started, because I was a bit unsure of if I wanted to do mycology, but now I'm quite certain I want to continue with it. So I think it's- So you're hooked, hopefully not, not onto penicillin. I mean, that's an awful fungus. <laughs> 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 hopefully we'll have... <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Kubis and I joke. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Kubis is crying about that. Any other questions that you would like to ask Aiden? And um, if you had some time also to Vilma. Nobody at the moment. I, I can maybe. I... Yes, Quivis. Excuse if, if Luna makes a noise in the background. Um... That's fine. Aiden, considering that the farms that you're uh, collecting from sits in the Feinbos area, don't you think that your soil will be more diverse than what you would usually find in agricultural soil? Yes, yeah, so, so that is something that I wish I had included as an additional sampling group, is a commercial agricultural farm outside of the Feinbos region as a comparison or as a negative control almost. 
um, because I definitely think that, um, especially when you consider the fact that a lot of these penicillins are air dispersed. So it's not too outlandish to think that they would travel just two fields um, from the native wild fanebos to, uh, to the farm, because the farms aren't very far away from native fanebos. Um, yeah, so I think that's definitely plausible. And, and just a follow up that on the phosphatases um, and growth studies that you're doing, um, I really think that the next step for us in penicillium is to take on the genomes. Um, I know there's a big effort sequencing a thousand aspergillus genomes and we shouldn't be left behind in, in penicillium on this. So you should really think about um, sequencing some of those species that seems to induce growth um, in wheat um, so that we can understand why, why it's doing that. Yeah, I think especially given the phylogenomics talks of today, I've seen there's a, there's a huge amount of utility in having those da that data because um, there's so many analyses that you can then perform afterwards, both in terms of uh, the population metrics and in terms of what in there is usable to us or helpful to us. Great. Any other questions? Um, David has made a comment. He says, congratulations on a great talk. And he he seconds the 1000 Penicillin Genomes Project and says you should propose it to the JGI. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll set up some collaborators and then we, <laughs> we see what happens. <laughs> Well, it's great because they, they, it, they're very unusual for a U.S. government facility, which is that, you know, that they will accept projects from anywhere. So the PI yeah. could be at Fabi, for example, or Stellenbosch. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. It's, it's definitely giving me a lot to think about today. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity that I've been given by the Systematic Society to, to meet everyone here and present my work. So thank you very much for listening to me. Great, and good luck with the final stages of your MSc. Um, so any other questions that you would like to, um, Lauren James has a very interesting talk. It's great to hear that at least some indigenous species are surviving and even being discovered out of the, meat, or the wheat monocrop. Um, so a comment there. Um, anything else that you, anybody that wants to raise a question, you're welcome to do so. Um, while you're thinking about it, um, let me just do a bit of a, um, a advertising. So as I said, the society, the systematic society has got their um, seminars on the first first day of the month, whereas Fabi's is usually the last Thursday of the month. But um, this time they sneaked over into the 1st of July, and we could make a joint um, effort. So um, on the 5th of August, we would have um, Dr. Sandra Knapp from the Natural History Museum in London. And she's going to talk about um, her work on the Solanaceaarum family. So potatoes, eggplant, all of those agricultural crops that we love to eat. So that's just a uh, heads up. Um, we will, you will see the adverts and things coming out as we get closer to the date. Um, Neriman, when is the next um, Fabi International Seminar? Just checking the calendar now. Uh, that is... 29th. Uh, 29th. 29th. Yeah. Okay. So on the 29th, there will also be an international and whether you belong to the one or the other um, group, we will inform you about these um, talks. And thanks a lot to everybody that um, stayed around and are willing to listen. I think it's a very also thank you from Fabi's side to the society for um, linking up with us. And then from the society to Fabi for linking up with us. So um, I hope that you've enjoyed this and um, there's still some scope for, for more talks. We're looking for young people to present their work in the society. So please remember that. Um, the final part of, uh, so let me ask, are there any other questions that you still want to raise to the speakers?
Um, somebody saying, in Kenya, we usually consider penicillium a contaminant. Have you found a pathogenic species on plants? Um, so in the agricultural field, when I looked at it, I didn't see uh, the pathogenic species, but it could also be that uh, I didn't look at... Um, I didn't really look at that. And the pathogenic species in penicillium don't often target wheat. Uh, so they're more often problematic for other crops, um, at least not pre-harvest. So I didn't look at any post-harvest environments. So in those environments, it, was, it would be far more likely to isolate those uh, problematic strains. Thank you. So, um, what we can do now is say, so yes, generally post harvest. That's Quibus's comment. That's what Aiden has said. So, um, the last part of the, so again, thank you to Aiden, to Vilma, and to David for um, giving their time and coming to talk to us. Um, I think we all agree that it was a wonderful seminar today. And thank you very much for making the effort and presenting very nice talks.